Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we have a few commissioners who are still making their way, but we are going to get started because we have an exciting um, day ahead of us. I want to make sure that we have time for everything, including the public comment period, which is at the end. So I'm just going to very quickly go through um, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, one is that for the commissioners, the microphone is a push button to touch. Uh, the bathrooms are right there. Uh, I want to again welcome our amazing graphic facilitator and longtime Institute for the Future affiliate, uh, a rock star in this circle and many others, Anthony Weeks, who's back with us. Um, and as we say all the time, commissioners, if you notice that Anthony has missed anything, then please let him know he, that he's asked us to say that and we want to make sure that, um, that you feel heard and that, and that we're capturing uh, what is being said. We are also live streaming. Um, and then you have Wi-Fi access and the access is there uh, on your table. Uh, and then I just also want to welcome the members of the public who have joined us, made their way uh, out here and um, remind you all that there are comment cards for comment that are on your chairs. And um, then you will put them in the basket, uh, the, the, the bowl, uh, which is right on that the, the table here to uh, my right. And then we will be doing comment period at the end of the session. And thank you all so much for, uh, for joining us. So we always like to start uh, by hearing from each commissioner through an introductory question. As you will recall, we have done your formative work experience. We've done a person who has been particularly influential, formative, transformative in your work or career. The last time we did um, uh, related to um, our education and skills and job quality topic, one thing that you wish that you had learned in your 20s, I'm just reminding you of things you've already shared about yourself. And so today we're actually going to ask you to go around, please say your name, and then share one group of people who often don't get included around the table in these types of conversations, but should be. Okay, and we are going to start actually with Lance Hastings. Good morning, Lance Hastings with the California Manufacturers and Technology Association. Uh, being part of the employer community uh, is important uh, for me to be here on the commission. Today we do have an employer perspective that's being brought to the table, but to the extent we can pepper those in because there are a variety of kinds of employers in the state, uh, and our sector happens to be a big economic driver, but having other employers come uh, before the commission and, and share their views I think would be helpful. Thank you so much, Lance. We're going to go to Governor Granholm. I think it would be really helpful to include people, as you say, who are not normally here. But what, when I say that, I'm talking about like single moms who have to work two jobs, who could never afford the time to even be in a place like this, but from whom we must hear if we are to craft policies that affect them. Um, Mariana Vituro, um, I, I would say domestic workers, though, uh, I guess my, in my official capacity, I'm the, representing the 2.5 million domestic workers in the country, but um, I guess broader, like, I think uh, low-wage women workers, um, I think the future of the workforce are women workers, and the fastest-growing sectors of our workforce is our low-wage uh, the low-wage sectors. Uh, I'm Lloyd Dean. It's great to uh, be here. Uh, the, the, I'm uh, excited because the two groups that I'm going to uh, reference are represented uh, at this table and uh, in the audience, and that is to ensure that we hear the voice of the workers uh, and of diverse ethnic uh, and diverse gender, if you will, uh, voices. Carla Javits, um, I would I'd call out uh, people who have been incarcerated, people who have experienced homelessness. Uh, I think some of the latest data shows that roughly 50% of people in California who are homeless are 50 and over, and many of them have only become homeless after age 50. So these are workers who are on the margins of our economy, and then we classify them as homeless people. And this is really an economic, uh, certainly it's a housing issue, but it, clearly it's an economic issue. And then we all know the implications of incarceration and the recidivism that happens when people can't get jobs. So hope we keep those squarely in mind. 
I'm <clears throat> Roy Bahat, and um, I'm going to do two quickly. One is uh, older workers um, who have, we may not even think of as workers anymore because we may, in our traditional mentality, think of them as having left the workforce. And the other, which is a little bit more of a struggle to articulate, is uh, potential future needs that our society may have don't always have a voice of a certain constituency in the present to call for them. And so imagining the sort of empty seat at the table for what could be and where our imagination and our beliefs about the future have to come in. Soraya Coley, Cal Poly Pomona. And uh, I must say that um, it's the students who are getting ready to uh, enter a very uncertain um, work uh, world of work. Doug Block with Teamsters Joint Council number seven. And when I look at our topic today, low wage work and economic equity, I think about workers of color in particular, African American workers, immigrant workers, uh, people that are not benefiting from the current economic system. And as Governor Granholm said, they can't be here today because they're working. Uh, so uh, I am really glad that at our first meeting we had a panel of low-wage workers of color, and I'm sorry that I missed it, and I wish we could have that at every single one of these convenings. Good morning, Maria Salinas with the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce. Um, I'm gonna take the privilege of identifying two. I think uh, for me, the youth is a big component. You mentioned the students. I think, you know, there, when you think of the future of work, uh, I think having a seat at the table from the youth component uh, would be very important. I think they're very entrepreneurial in nature, which leads me to my second. I think it's the small business community. You know, when a business grows, there seems to be a pivot there when they can, you know, deal with a lot of the compliance that may re be required even as a small business. But I think there's that element of entrepreneurs that are getting started, that are gearing up, that it would be important to hear from them as well. Mm -hmm. Good morning, John Marshall with the United Food and Commercial Workers International Union. And um, I would echo the comments of Commissioner Block and others who talked about uh, low wage workers, in particular workers of color and women and immigrants. Uh, you know, in my day job, uh, working with investors and analysts who cover publicly traded companies, um, you know, one of the things I've found to be most uh, productive is when we can actually bring frontline workers uh, workers who are often considered to be uh, low-skill uh, workers, but are not actually low-skill workers, as uh, Commissioner uh, Jaya Rahman has uh, repeated uh, a number of times for us. Um, they have tremendous knowledge about uh, operations, uh, about um, uh, customer service, about marketing, about a whole range of issues uh, which are often not uh, recognized. And so when we think about solutions, uh, increasing access to unions, but also things about governance, uh, you know, board representation. I think there's a lot uh, that this community of workers has to offer. I'm Saru, uh, and a, a founder of Rock with One Fair Wage, and everybody's been saying low wage workers. I would definitely echo that. I think, in particular. Um, would love to bring to the table the growing world of service workers in particular, and especially the things that I work on, thinking about people who rely on tips, which is no longer just restaurant workers anymore. It is such an explosively growing part of our economy from, uh, uh, and you know, tech plays a big role in this with Instacart and DoorDash and Uber and Lyft, but also even, unfortunately, Apple Pay has been spreading tipping to retail environments so that now we're tipping in coffee shops and florist shops. And um, it's, you know, we're basically, unfortunately, partly through technology and partly through some bad policy, growing the dependence of many, many more workers across our economy on the crazy fluctuating nature of gratuities, which is not what gratuities were intended to be. They were never intended to be the wage. They were always intended to be a supplement, but it reflects the increasing precariousness of our world and hearing from workers who are having to rely on the precariousness of tips 
would give us insight into the precariousness in general of work. Good morning, uh, I'm Betty Yee, California State Controller. Um, I want to agree with all of my colleagues around the table, but just to say that um, I would love to have a, a rural perspective uh, with respect to all of the um, constituencies that have been identified. The question is what group of people are not usually including these conversations, but should be? Thank you. Uh, good morning, Ash Kalra, assembly member from San Jose. And I don't know uh, if it was already said, but building upon what I've already heard, and what Sara was just talking about is uh, uh, low wage workers, but those that are a part of the underground economy, those that are paid under the table with cash that wouldn't, you know, but are very unlikely to step forward to be part of a process like this, or even in our own communities when we have convenings. Uh, they're the ones that are oftentimes left out. And so uh, if we could be intentional about uh, thinking about those that are part of the underground economy as well. Thank you all so much. I know we're always so excited about the questions because your answers are so rich and wonderful. So thank you. Um, I did want to uh, express apologies from Supervisor Hilda Solis, who uh, actually could not be here, but we're really excited that um, Amanda Daflos, who is from Mayor Garcetti's office, is just going to say a very quick welcome to you. Good morning, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and represent Mayor Garcetti um, and also to welcome you to Los Angeles just as I sit down quickly here. Um, we're so excited that you all are here. We're very grateful um, to the commissioners who are taking up this really important uh, task and this really important conversation. It's something here in Los Angeles that has been um, a critical topic and we're very excited to collaborate with you and to also see the outcomes um, that I know are forthcoming this summer. Um, so again, just a, a tremendous welcome to all of you as the honorable commissioners and to the public. I would really appreciate uh, that members of the LA public have been here and showed up to this important discussion. So thank you and welcome. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, in every location that we've gone to, we actually try to find a space for our meeting that is reflective both of the topic and the really um, broad, uh, expansive uh, vision that we have. Uh, and so um, to that end, we actually, when we first thought about being in LA, talking about low-wage workers and economic equity, thought about trying to find a space at a worker center, right, which would both um, highlight some of the um, excluded communities that, that you, many of you have mentioned, uh, but also really um, give a, a spotlight to the incredibly dynamic work that's going on in Los Angeles around organizing and raising worker voices. Um, it turns out that we could not find a space that could meet all of the various needs, including just the sheer size. Uh, but we are very, very excited to be here at the Riveter, uh, which is a uh, which is we chose partly not only because it's beautiful and spacious and bright, uh, but it also is committed to empowering women uh, and its work um, and, and, and to create a space for working women and their allies. Um, and uh, we all know that part of closing the, um, uh, the, the, the gaps and inequities in our society is about closing the gender gap and making sure that women thrive in our economy. And so thank you to the folks at the Riveter. And the last just thank you and acknowledgement that, that we want to make was that we are um, really excited that there are um, members of three foundations who have supported this work from the very beginning, who are here today. So we just wanted to acknowledge them. And it's the Ford Foundation, the Irvine Foundation, and Blue Shield of California Foundation, all of whom are supporting the work of the Institute for the Future, which has been an invaluable partner in all this. They're also funded by the Lumina Foundation, who is not here. But uh, just to take a moment. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so um, in case you haven't noticed, the person sitting next to me is not Mary Kay Henry, and I'm not James Manyika. So the, uh, our co-chairs uh, send their regrets of not being able to participate today. So we're stepping in as facil facilitators, not members of the commission. So we're not gonna be offering comments or anything. We're just trying to keep the process going, but um, appreciate again, as Julie said, everyone being here today. Um, I just want to very briefly cover what what we're going to talk about today. Um, there are uh, on page seven of your materials is the depiction of what we're doing today. This is the fourth convening taking place in Los Angeles. And we're talking about questions that are on the right hand side of that page, the four questions. 
what floors should be in place to ensure that the livelihood of all California workers, wages, benefits, work conditions, scheduling, et cetera. Secondly, what are the key barriers to economic equity faced by workers of color, immigrant workers, and other marginalized workers in California? Number three, what strategies or policies could encourage employers to employ high road employment and discourage a race to the bottom by competing primarily on wages? And then fourth, what policies or strategies can help shape technological development to improve jobs and promote economic equity rather than displacing jobs or exacerbating inequality? So things like funding for R&D, incentives, regulation, uh, about the adoption of technology, data collection, et cetera. So big, rich topics that we'll explore and solve and have exact recommendations for within a couple hours today. So really look forward to the conversation. But uh, they should, it, we're uh, delighted to be able to have this conversation with all of you. I know uh, the combination of uh, travel challenges, uh, the things that happen this time of year with uh, illnesses and family obligations and everything else has made it a little hard for a number of people either coming or going to have to be late, leave early or not attending. But we uh, appreciate all of you making the time today and decided that We've got a critical mass and we wanted to keep pushing forward with our aggressive agenda. So thank you all for coming today. Okay, and now I just want to remind everyone that Lynn Jeffrey is going to continue to be, there she is, our, our overall voice of the agenda and timekeeper. So she's going to um, also ensure that we're on time because if those of us who are around the table, myself and Julie included, uh, end up not paying attention to that. It will be 10 o'clock tonight before we get through the first agenda item. So we'll apologize in advance if she's trying to move us along a little faster than, than uh, we might otherwise. So thank you again, Lynn. Yes, just to echo that a little bit, we know that sometimes, you know, there's always the tension between wanting to hear everybody's comments and allowing us to dig deep and have a full conversation, and also knowing that we're trying to accomplish everything that we set out to accomplish, not just in each day, but throughout the life of the uh, of the commission, and we're really thankful to Lynn for helping uh, to drive that part forward. Um, one other thing that came up at the last convening that I just wanted to make sure that we addressed here was there was the question of what is our charge in terms of who are we making recommendations to, right? There was this, you know, are these recommendations to the governor because the governor put the commission together? Is it broader than the governor? And then how broad is it? And so we wanted to um, just be clear that the governor's mandate was not just to make recommendations to him, although obviously that is definitely squarely within the, the, the work of the commission, but to think about all the various sectors of our society, of our economy, and what they can do to solve the issues and challenges and problems that, we are, that, that, that we've been talking about and we'll be digging in more deeply on today. So just wanted to be very clear about that mandate. That's also partly why the diversity of perspectives that you all represent uh, were, were brought um, onto the commission. Okay, so we're gonna dive right in to our opening um, all-star panel. Uh, and um, this panel is actually on low-wage work um, and economic equity. And today we're actually gonna hear from um, both uh, two people who've done tremendous work in the low-wage worker and economic equity space. And then uh, a little bit later, we're going to hear from employers um, who have also uh, not just thought about this issue a lot, but really made um, commitments and practices to um, using their role to address low wage work issues and economic equity. So turn it over to Anmo. Great, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for that, Julie. And uh, I think we're thrilled we have an uh, outstanding panel to talk about these issues today uh, with Abel Valenzuela and Manuel Pastor from USC who will be joining us very shortly. I think he's on his way right now. Um, it's coming over from a commitment that ended but half an hour ago or so. Um, and just to set up some of this, this the, the context for this conversation, and uh, you know, I think much of this will be familiar to folks already by now, but I think it's useful to just revisit. We are now in the longest economic expansion in US history. Um, we, the state of California now has had, is the longest running uh, streak of continued job growth that's been going on for 116 months. It's almost 10 years of straight month-to-month uh, -month job growth. Uh, we have extraordinary, uh, by historical standards, very low unemployment rates. In California, the latest numbers are it's under 4%, just under 4%, 3.9% across the state. By all measures, we have a very strong, successful economy across the U.S., and especially in California. Uh, California, I think, 
in many ways, at, at, by all macro level indicators or measures, would be the envy of many other states in, in the country um, and has produced an extraordinary amount of wealth and continues to do so across a range of industries. Um, in many ways, we can think of this as the best economic conditions that many of us have ever seen in our lives and, and maybe even the best economic conditions uh, imaginable or realistic. Um, so what is it, what is the world, what, what does it look like for workers in what's quite literally the best economic conditions we've ever seen, uh, the best that they could be? Um, we knew from, we know from our last convening that in California, only 40% of workers are in jobs that would be considered good jobs um, through rigor, rigorous empirical analysis by Gallup. Uh, so the majority of workers in California, despite all these strong, uh, the strong economic conditions are not in good jobs. Um, the focus today on low wage workers in California, in LA, across the LA metro area, uh, research from Brookings is showing that 53% of all workers in LA, that's 2.7 million workers in LA, the LA metro area are low wage workers. So the majority, the more than half. Um, when we look at some of the other locations for our convenings that we've had uh, last month, we were in Riverside where 52% of workers are low wage workers. Uh, next month we'll be in San Diego, 49% of workers there are low wage workers. Um, in the Bay Area it's a bit lower, around 40% or so. Um, across the whole state, just in the metro areas of California, we have seven million workers who are considered low wage workers. It's exactly one half of all workers. So again, this is, this is what it looks, this is about as best as it can get in terms of our economic conditions. And this is the realities that are facing half of the workers in California. Um, and, I, and I mentioned that specifically to say that often we think about low wage work as the, say the lowest uh, 20% or the lowest 10% or you know, people, fo folks who face important, uh, very important issues or problems or, or challenges, um, but are still a, a not the majority of, of workers in the state. And when we're at a point now where half of the workers in California are considered low wage, low wage workers, that's the typical worker in California. That is the California worker, is a low wage worker. We're talking about California workers today. Um, I was talking to a colleague recently about this and uh, about you know, just trying to make sense of this whole, how can this, ha how can this be going on at the same time where we have these extraordinary economic conditions, yet most people in California in this, in this very economically successful state are struggling. Um, and, and it was a colleague of mine, Jean, who described this metaphor, the image she had in her mind was one of a, a, a tree, and specifically a redwood tree, I think, for California, where from the outside of a tree, you can, it, it can appear healthy and it can, appear, it can appear strong, but you don't actually have much information about what's going on, the health of the tree, and it requires somebody to actually drill in or, 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 or go into the core of the tree and pull out um, what's in the core and then assess there what's, uh, you know, what's the health of that tree and what's the health of that redwood. And from the outside, it appears like California has a very strong economy uh, and strong situation, but we're joined today by Abel and Manuel who are here to help take us into that core of that tree, right? To help us understand how we're doing by getting more in depth into, the, uh, in, into this group of low-wage workers who we now know is the majority of, of, of Los Angeles. Um, I'll introduce Abel quickly and then we'll hear from him as Manuel makes his way um, over to the site. Abel Valenzuela is a professor of urban planning and Chicano studies at UCLA. He's also the director of uh, the Institute for Research on Labor and Employment at UCLA. He's a scholar of uh, immigration, immigrant settlement, immigrant communities, work, low wage work, urban poverty. He has uh, done extraordinary work, especially looking at um, day laborers um, in, in LA and other large cities across the country. Um, and has deep understanding of immigrant labor markets. Abel is also born and raised in Los Angeles. Um, so with that, I'll turn to Abel and I'll actually ask, as we've done this in the past, before getting into about five minutes or so of remarks you may have prepared, I want to ask you to actually start with laying out uh, three or so main points or three big takeaways that you'd want the commissioners to take away as sort of set up the comments of, you know, you want me to finish with three takeaways, or do you want me to begin I want you with three? To tell takeaways. them what those takeaways are up front, and then to set the context for for the rest of the information, so that uh, got it. I, I did my homework, yeah, <laughs> and and I took it seriously. So three takeaways. Um, yeah, it was. Oh, you're. Oh, that, how's better? Yes. So my three takeaways: the the things that I want folks to consider um, are the first is. DACA repeal and the future of work in California for a very significant 
group of young folks that we've already invested in. Second, the future of work and decriminal decriminalization in California. And then the third is making work pay, in quotation marks, further. Um, so something new, something old, um, <laughs> and something that I think has more of a, a, a moral imperative, but I think an easy fix. Okay. Um, I was asked to um, provide some background um, framing for why I might have selected these three areas. And so I, I really thought about what I might um, share with you all. And so I put a few things down. So in, indulge me. And I'm happy then to talk about the three areas um, with a little bit more specificity. Um, I, I've been at UCLA for more than 25 years. I'm one of four founding faculty members of a department that was created um, from a hunger strike, some of you might remember. I'm aging myself here. Um, but it's an important um, historical context here in Los Angeles. I wore multiple hats as a result of being at UCLA for 25 years, um, including one of my most important um, roles, which um, three years ago I was asked by the chancellor um, to convene and then lead what's called the Chancellor's Advisory Council on Immigration Policy. This committee um, brings together faculty, staff, and students to, if you will, problem solve on our campus in the face of a hostile White House, specifically targeting um, undocumented immigrants, but also international students. They also fall under my portfolio. I'm here in referring to um, extremely vetted um, students uh, from certain countries, but also from Muslim-majority countries. We have lots of scholars um, to engage in UCLA in the practice of research and teaching, and so they are a part of our student body, and so I'm um, in a now different role trying to better understand policies coming down and how we enhance experience on campus. Um, I'm a product of California and the UC system. I'm not sure I'll ever leave um, UCLA um, because of some of these roles that I've been asked to do. They're extremely important. They're also exciting. Um, and I'm getting better able to figure out how to leverage um, UCLA's resources and its student body um, in ways that can, I think, make an, a better impact on worker lives, the working class, of course, and also all Californians. I think UCLA and the rest of the University of California um, should be at their disposal. Um, not only is the UC an economic driver, but it can also drive how we shape work, workers' human capacity, public policy, and, their, and its implementation, analysis, and how we can adjust to help guide and shape the future of work and workers. Um, and so in my role as director of the Institute, um, I get to implement a teaching program um, that is robust and growing. Um, we, I co-teach with Kent Wong an intro to labor studies class that has over 260 students. That's unheard of in the University of California. It's full of students of different backgrounds wanting to explore work and how that can be an avenue for social change and equity. You work hard, you should be paid well, that should allow you to escape poverty or so. The story's been told over and over. Um, I'm the son of a hardworking immigrant um, father who was an upholsterer and a mother who was a teacher, um, elementary school teacher for the Montebello Unified School District. Um, I realize it's cliche um, to bring up the um, son of an immigrant household, um, but in this contemporary and very hostile environment um, that targets immigrants, I do prefer to embrace that part of me in solidarity and also in truth telling. Um, I was born and raised here in Los Angeles, Boyle Heights to be exact, not too far away. I live nearby in Venice, so I want to thank the organizers <laughs> for this nice location here on the west side. I have a, a, a five-year-old who does have a fever, and I told his babysitter I would be back by noon. Um, so I, I, I will be able to do that. 
Um, like all of you, I'm deeply, deeply concerned about our state and its future workforce and work. Um, as I mentioned, I, I do have one boy. I also have two other ones. And so I worry about them and their future all the time. But I'm also very, very hopeful and confident that there's lots of smart people, um, empirics and well-known pathways that can help us bridge the gap between the have and the have-nots, the poor and working poor and just beyond poor and many workplace and worker issues. We know what we can do to fix it and there's lots of folks right around this table and beyond who can proffer lots of different solutions. Um, why else am I hopeful and, and confident? Um, the work that we do um, at the Institute, more specifically um, at the Labor Center. Um, we've been undertaking work on immigrant organizing, but on social justice and on labor markets to better understand these inequities that many of us pay attention to. Um, but we do things a little bit differently. We integrate research, teaching, and service across different layers, both faculty, students, and staff researchers. So when you might think of um, the research enterprise, you might think of faculty and perhaps PhD students. And we certainly undertake that role, but we also integrate undergrad students and we have a staff of researchers from different backgrounds who also engage with us, including workers who we constantly vet our findings to make sure we get it correctly. Um, our work explores work, workers, as well as the institutional, historical, and other ways that work is structured, including race, gender, and other others. Our research projects are contemporary. For example, we pay attention to youth employment, real, re retail trade scheduling, the gig economy, um, the whole notion that um, Lyft and Uber drivers are doing this as a part-time supplement to perhaps anything else makes absolutely no empiric sense. And we have studies where we place students in um, situations that allow them to survey and talk to workers to better understand their working lives to then proffer up different sorts of solutions. Um, we also are currently paying attention to youth as well as um, student employment. We know that the cost of attending higher, um, insti higher institutions of higher learning has skyrocketed. Um, and we also know that many more students are working than ever before. Nothing bad with that, except that many of these students are now using their um, resources to cover tuition or they're un unable to attend school contiguously, having to take quarters off, for example, um, to make their earnings. I think I'm being signaled that um, timing is yeah, getting close. Let, mm -hmm. Yeah. I saw, I mean, I want to hear that the, the sponsor on DACA repeal. Sure. Right? Let me sure. then. Um, and then we'll get a chance to introduce Manuel. Of course. And, you know. So th th it gives you an orientation of how I'm um, framing my, my mm -hmm. comments. Now, let me jump into the, the first DACA repeal, or should I go through all three? Um, the, you could start, start with DACA repeal, explain what it is and, where, sure. where, and how it's affecting uh, low wage workers in LA. Absolutely. So my first takeaway that I'd like the commission to consider is um, through my work as special advisor to the chancellor on immigration policy, um, we've been working with undocumented students at UCLA. They number close to 700. These are DACA, AB 540, and um, a, a a status that doesn't include either of those numbers, close to 750. When you add the other campuses, we're talking about close to 4,000. Um, that's in the University of California system. You need to also consider the California State University system. We're talking about thousands of students who are matriculating um, um, and graduating from these institutions, many of them may not have a pathway to employment if the Supreme Court upholds um, the Trump administration's executive order. Um, is there something that the state can do? Absolutely. Um, you might even think of a, a, a workforce and a, or an apprentice program. We've already had many high tech companies, for example, signal they're wanting to um, engage in work with 
for example, DACA student. Um, the takeaway in part is that we shouldn't only be talking about DACA students, but rather um, all undocumented students who number in the thousands um, at many of our institutions, public as well as private. They're gonna be leaving those institutions highly skilled and trained. We need to figure out a way uh, to transition them into California's employment worlds. So that's the first takeaway. That's great. Decriminalization. I think is Decriminalization. Second. Success at ending structural inequality in California also requires addressing the intersection between the future of work and the future of our policies on decriminalization. These, this is also a priority for the governor. So entangling low wage earners with the courts, um, with probation and parole systems and prison or um, jails for years, it really does cripple labor force participation and it also commits state dollars to expensive systems of supervision. Um, of course, the more fundamental shift would be to stop criminalizing poverty in the first place, but really we need to be transitioning to a post-war on drugs economy. Um, an urgent priority, I think, for our institute is to support unionized workers um, to help shape the movement towards decarceration and decriminalization in California. In LA County alone, so, uh, many of you know, we've embarked on an effort to support the reform of the nation's largest, the largest probation system by elevating the need to bridge the labor movement and community-based organizations, especially those led by formerly incarcerated people. To lead these efforts um, at UCLA, we're working with Saul Sarabia um, and others. Um, he, he was a part of the team um, that chaired LA County's probation reform and implementation team. Um, probation reform is moving in a different direction and there are thousands of workers who will need to be retrained as we move towards a more social work model. Um, probation workers are gonna find themselves without if you will, a client base, because that client base is shifting to what I believe is a more humane and thoughtful way to deal um, with post-criminalization. The last um, takeaway is, I think, um, something that everybody has heard. Um, it's more of the same, um, but I think it's important. Minimum wage, double down, add to it. Um, increases should be reconsidered and possibly amended increased uh, or increased. Cost of living continues to grow faster than income and wages, and we've already made the plunge. Not at all clear to me that some of the adverse effects by um, initial naysayers about the deleterious impact of minimum wage increases um, has been as bad. Um, when I speak to students about the role of the state and different interventions and impacts, I argue that California's move to increase our minimum wage to eventually reach $15 an hour in a couple of years is perhaps the most important anti-poverty measure ever passed by our state. It makes a huge difference for working people. Do the numbers. Uh, multiply 2080 by 15, by 16, by $17, and then compare it to the federal poverty threshold. There's a big difference. We shouldn't be afraid to revisit that issue. Um, we've already done it. And so I'm thinking, why not? Um, this might be something that we can consider in the same spirit of other national um, campaigns, like One Fair Wage, certainly. Other efforts. So my yeah. three points. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Abel. We'll, and we'll be revisiting all of this as we get into conversation with the with, with commissioners. Um, so I'll quickly introduce Manuel and, and take a few minutes uh, for you, Manuel, as well. Manuel Pastor is a distinguished professor of sociology at USC and professor of American studies and ethnicity. Currently directs the program for environmental and regional equity at USC and the Center for the Study of Immigrant Integration. And his large body of work has, has focused on issues of the economic, environmental, and social conditions facing low-income communities, low-income urban communities, and um, also the social movements and policies that, that, uh, that the state can, can implement to change those realities, right? So let me hand it over to Manal. And I, so the question actually I asked Abel to start with was um, if, if you were able to start with sort of the three high-level 
three high level points that you'd want the commission to take away from, from your comments first and then add the, the substance after that. Great, so um, this will move into some slides. I think, I think it's the other one. What's that? Yeah. Oh good, I went backwards. Um, so good to be with you. I feel like a Los Angeles stereotype because I was late because of traffic. <laughs> um, but I am challenging the Los Angeles stereotype because I'm here with my good friend from UCLA, uh, and I'm from USC, which suggests that uh, this could be the beginning of peace in the Middle East if these two schools um, could get along. Uh, the, I guess the thing I want to, uh, three big takeaways, and then we'll jump to the data and some policies. First takeaway is that just as California has been America fast forward on demographic change, it's been America fast forward in terms of inequality. It's actually outpaced the rest of the nation uh, in some very important and concerning ways. Second, race is an important part of that story and yet hardly ever gets left up in terms of thinking explicitly about how much racial disparity persists and actually has gotten worse in the California economy. And I guess the third point is that there really are a set of policies we can do to address these things generally, but also much more specifically target the racial disparities. And you'll see why that's so important going forward um, into the future. Uh, now, of course, like any academic, I show up to casually ask, answer questions with slides. Um, and sort of the first part of this is, you know, of course, California has seen, like a lot of other states, the 1% run away from the rest of us. Uh, and so what I wanna do is go beneath that to people who are actually working. And this looks at full-time year-round workers uh, between 1980 and 2016, and says at different points on the uh, wage distribution, the 90th percentile, 10% make more, 90% make less, 20, 80th, 20 make more, 80% make less. What's happened to real wages over that period of time? And what you can see here is uh, the gray bars are the United States. You can see the widening divide that's been typical of the United States, but you can see that it's been exacerbated in California. That is, uh, for those at the 90th percentile, their real wage gains have been on the order of 30%. For those at the bottom, their real wage losses have been on the order of 19% over that 40-year period. And that's more exacerbated than for the United States as a whole. We often focus on that gap between those who are more educated, <coughs> excuse me, and doing better, those who are less educated doing less well. But it's important to realize that the baseline for this is that workers in general have not done well in the state of California. Um, the uh, blue bars are the United States, the uh, uh, sort of gold bars, because after all, this is the golden state, uh, are the United, are, are California. Between 1979 and 2016, hourly compensation, which is not just wages, but benefits, rose in real terms in California for the median worker by 5%. But the productivity of that worker rose by nearly 100%. So people are producing twice as much as they did back in 1979. Their real uh, hourly compensation has only gone up by about 5%. That's been a massive reduction in labor share, a massive gain in the business share of income. So as much as we want to address the widening divide, we also want to address the imbalance between capital and labor, business and labor in the economy. Part of what Professor Valenzuela was talking about is uh, part of that. Um, but what I really want to focus in on, because I understand it hasn't been talked about um, as much as I normally uh, would talk about it, are the racial divides. So when you talk about low wage work, this is the share of workers by race and gender making less than $15 an hour in the California economy. Certainly, uh, it's a problem for white workers as well, about 14% of white males, about 18% of white females. But if you look at the uh, African American, really about a quarter of African American workers are making less than $15 an hour. When you move to Latinos, uh, it's nearly half, particularly nearly half of Latina uh, workers. And it's important to realize that this is a problem for Asian American Pacific Islanders as well. Uh, when we look at the, national, the, the overall data, you'll see this in a minute, Asian American Pacific Islander household incomes are about as high as they are 
for whites in the state of California. What that mask says, these are bigger households, so there's more income contributing, and second, tremendous bifurcation. Some Asian Americans doing very well, but a lot of Asian Americans, particularly from Southeast Asia, not doing well at all. Now, it would be easy to think, as we normally go to this, that the reason why you see this disparity in terms of being able to make wages is got to do with education. Um, and you're going to ask, why am I showing 1990 data? I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, but if you look at 1990 data, um, this you'll see something that your mother and father probably drilled into you, that if you get educated, your wages will go up. So this is median wages by education level, moving from people with less than a high school degree to a BA or higher. And one of the things that you'll notice is that more education, more money, but you'll notice looking at the 1990 data that at each and every level of education, there's a wage penalty for being African American or Latino, or in most cases for being Asian. Here's what's interesting. We would hope as we turn to the year 2016 that that wage disparity by education level would have done what? Closed. But if you look at it, it's actually gone up, except at the highest levels of education. But in particular, if you go for the group with less than a high school degree or a high school degree and no college, the wage penalty you pay for being black or Latino in the California economy is actually higher now. So we've gone backwards. Now, why is that? There's still persistent racial discrimination in hiring markets, particularly for African Americans, for Latinos. Some of that has to do with immigration and immigration status, but not as much change has happened between 1980 and 2000 as you think. Here's another really important part of this that people don't lift up in the data. This is for Los Angeles County. I could have done it for California, but heck, you're here in LA. So look at LA data. Um, so this is median household income by race and ethnicity. It shows a pattern of disparity that we would imagine. Uh, $76,000 median household income, half make more, half make less. Um, uh, so uh, then when you move to African Americans, 41,000. Latino households, 46,000. API households in Los Angeles tend to be a little bit poorer, so 68,000. Um, that shows a pattern of disparity. This is the same graph with the same axes looking at households that have children under the age of five. And what you're going to see is that the disparities grow dramatically. So for white households with children, median household income is 111,000. For API, about 92,000. But basically the same household incomes for African Americans and Latinos when they have children under the age of five. So what looked like a significant disparity is even a worse disparity if you're asking the question, what are the economic situations in which the next generation is growing up and therefore being able to garner the resources, education levels, et cetera, to be able to compete in the next economy? A uh, Couple of other things and then I'll uh, close. Um, First is that an important part of the state, which we forget to talk about, although we've made a lot of progress on it in the state, is uh, the undocumented immigrant population. This is just for Los Angeles County, because I'm gonna jump into one part of it, but this data is not that different for the state of California. This is looking at the longevity of the undocumented population. Interesting thing is that nearly 70% of the undocumented population in Los Angeles County has been here for a decade or longer. They are undocumented Californians. They are deeply rooted in our community. They are deeply rooted in our businesses. They are deeply rooted in our general social structure. And another way to take a look at that is this is again for LA County, undocumented folks and the family members who live with them. Not just the family members who might live in the, in the neighborhood as well, but actually live in the same household. So in LA County, about, about 900,000 uh, family member uh, people are undocumented, but living with them is another 850,000 US born family members, and living with them as well is more than 250,000 people who have a green card 
but have an undocumented family member. It's one of the reasons why the uh, sort of current uh, regime, which is sort of random detention, uh, is so frightening to so many people. But if you add up all that numbers, that means that 20% of LA County is touched by a lack of immigration status, either for themselves or for a family member that might be a wage earner. If we do not, as Californians, design a workforce development system that can actually understand that these people are here, that they're part of our future as are their children, and how do we begin to open up workforce development? Maybe we can't use federal dollars for it, but how do we open up our state dollars and state training systems for people who are clearly part of our economy? It's crucial. <clears throat> Final thing, uh, with uh, policy link, and we can talk a little bit more in the Q&A about policies that might drive this, what we tried to do is to quantify how much are we losing by allowing racial disparity to continue to exist. Now, there's other kinds of disparity, very, very important. Uh, we don't properly uh, on, on, onboard disabled people into our economy and take full advantage of their talents. There's uh, gender discrimination, which I think is incredibly uh, crucial as well. There's just the wage disparity in general. I just am trying to lift up something that hasn't been lifted up so much. I'm not saying it's the most important thing. I just know it hasn't been in your conversation so much. But if we were to try to close the wage disparity by both closing the education gaps and by closing the discrimination gaps that exist in labor markets, there would be for the California economy a nearly $1 trillion boost in GDP. Now, I think it's a Republican Senator Everett Dirksen who once said, a billion here, a billion there. After a while, you're talking real money, right? A trillion here, a trillion there. We need to have an all-in effort to close the racial disparity gap as part of the work that you're lifting up. And I could talk a little bit more about policies that might get us there. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Manuel. That's a there's a lot to, to, to delve into. And then the, one, the question I would actually just to jump off with it before we get questions with commissioners for, I think both of you, you know, so you've done a great job of laying out these inequities in the labor market by demographic groups, by race, by immigrant status, and, and, and other factors as well. How do we understand the sort of the structure of the labor market that produces these outcomes? Um, I think there's a, if we start with a, say, a, a very basic model, a standard model of a labor market, right, where you have workers who are on the supply side and you have jobs or employers on the other side, and people are matching to jobs and people are getting skills and training and they're uh, finding the best job that's available to them and the employers are looking for the, the, the best workers that are available and people are being matched to jobs and there's, those are the main determinants, right? And so I think that that's the sort of a really standard basic economic model of the labor market. Um, is there is there something else going on in our labor market across California or in LA in particular? Is there something? Is it uh, uh, is it a model of like a, a segmentation in the labor market where there's a low wage segment like that where that's focused um, or disproportionately composed of, of certain workers from certain communities and different groups? Why is that the case? How what are those barriers in place that are preventing people from moving between segments of the labor market? And then, uh, and this is all within two, uh, two minutes or so, and you've done this to people on your dissertation committee, so I feel comfortable putting you guys on the spot and making people answer very difficult questions in short amounts of time. Um, you mentioned also discrimination, right? And the question, so one, one of the questions there is that's a, a, how much of this is about direct, explicit discrimination on the behalf of, say, an employer or whoever else having a personal dislike for uh, someone of a specific racial group and deciding not to hire them or wanting to pay them less? Or are there other factors or other processes that help explain why we see these massive disparities that could persist in the absence even of an employer with who's discriminating on an individual level? So whoever, yeah. We're on the west side, dude, you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would pay attention to emerging labor markets. Um, and this is something that the commission is clearly doing. Um, that's perhaps the one area um, that drives our students, for example, who want to engage in research projects, right? Um, trying to understand apps and how they're producing new service jobs. Um, and by extension, um, the lack of any sort of regulation um, of these emerging jobs until they come um, uh, until they become um, frequented by thousands of um, potential clients and and workers, and then we start hearing of abuses, and then um, by then we're we're trying to figure out what to do. 
Um, so I think it's in part having to pay attention to emerging labor markets and how we not only understand them, but how we move to um, protect um, worker um, protections. Um, I think um, with regards to some of the, 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 the you know, explicit discrimination, I'm not sure I would even frame it that way. I think it's unscrupulous employers who um, find themselves in an environment of, of unfettered, if you will, regulation, deregulation. And so they move forward and exploit and try to extract as much as they can from workers. Um, does um, race come into place? Yes, I imagine in lots of different contexts. Does um, immigration come into place? Absolutely. Um, you know, um, and we have lots of audit and other sorts of studies um, um, that play that out. And so I think uh, any sort of response um, has to have a focus on race, right? Depending on the specific labor market context. Restaurant industry is one perfect example, both racial and gender discrimination at the front and the back end of the, um, uh, of the shop. And so that requires, I think, a more explicit sort of intervention that pays attention to race. Um, those employers that discriminate based on their uh, an immigration status likewise has to be addressed very explicitly um, in, in, in that context. So by no means should we shy um, away from both the real barriers and the challenges in terms of what we do to um, push back against that. Um, I think the question is more. Sure. Manuel. Yeah, so I uh, wrote a book several years ago with uh, Chris Benner from UC uh, Santa Cruz. If this was a dissertation defense, I'd be asking you a lot of questions about it and whether you'd read it. But uh, it's called Staircases or Treadmills. And we actually thought about a sort of framework that I think might be very useful for this group about uh, meeting, uh, molding, and making markets. And most uh, job placement is about meeting. It's like taking people who have skills, can't find jobs, how do the intermediaries get them together? Uh, molding is often about developing human capital in order to meet employer needs. That's a very good thing. But making markets is about how to use public policy to drive advanced manufacturing, to improve conditions in the care industry, to improve conditions in the hospitality industry. How do you make markets so that they can actually be more high performing for low wage workers? And that requires some degree of intentionality. The problem right now in California is it's all going in the other direction. Um, there are three big phenomena, I think, that are important to pay attention to that we need to address. Um, the first is that we've got uh, the sort of expansion of market power. And while in the old days, a U.S. Steel or a John D. Rockefeller would acquire monopoly power by simply acquiring a lot of replicable processes, oil drilling or, or steel manufacturing, and clustering them and grabbing power, power is now implicit in the platform economy. Once you get the ride share industry, you've got a monopoly. Once you've got Facebook, you can buy Instagram and make people think that they're on something else. Um, you acquire a monopoly platform. So that's built in the economy. Second thing, because we've shifted to a knowledge economy, we're clustering workers together. And when we cluster workers together, as is happening on the west side, you wind up pricing everyone else out. And you wind up getting low wage workers living on the periphery of where the jobs might be, uh, but they simply can't afford to be nearby. Third thing that we don't fundamentally realize about the California economy, it's very easy to understand, is that behind every software engineer is an army of nannies and food service workers and gardeners. And unless we understand that the skill is clustering both highly rewarded workers and lowly rewarded workers, and that there's nothing inconsistent between promoting our tech industry and raising our minimum wage, that those two things actually go together, even as we try to grow the middle of the labor market, I think that's a fundamental kind of shift in our thinking that needs to take place. With regard to discrimination, a lot of the research, I mean, you know, just one fact to stick in your mind, if you're uh, white and you have a criminal record, you are more likely to get a job than if you're African-American and you do not have a criminal record, controlling for the same education level. So there's still persistent discrimination. Most people who try to estimate this with wage regressions think that somewhere between you know, 40 to 50% of 
of the disparity that happens for African American workers is because of discrimination, somewhere between 15 and 20 percent for Latinos is because of just wage discrimination. Now, it also gets built in a different way because we've had a very racially skewed, racist incarceration system. A lot of employers are assuming when they see a black applicant that that person is carrying a criminal justice record even if they don't uh, somehow show it. And so there, that kind of discrimination goes on. A lot of our research on the wage gains from becoming a citizen, and I really want to single out the great work of the uh, Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce at working with community-based organizations on promoting citizenship. There's a big wage gain when you become a citizen. Part of that looks like it's because employers are like, great, you're a citizen, I don't need to worry about whether you're undocumented. Mm -hmm. So that's a discrimination that goes on because of the way we haven't reformed our immigration system. So there's both conscious discrimination, I think some of that takes place in the restaurant industry, and then there's making assumptions based on statistical patterns that winds up reproducing the racially disparate uh, outcomes over time. Great, thank you. I think Lloyd, you wanted to jump in, right? And then, uh, yes, uh, first of all, thank you for both for your presentation. Very uh, compelling, uh, particularly our articulation of the set of uh, problems. Uh, one of the outcomes of the work of the commission is all is around policy. It's not exclusively that, but around policy. So I would uh, ask each of you to identify one or two of the most impactful policies uh, that you would ask this commission to consider for the specific problems that you just articulated that are highly impactful, but also Doable. Uh, do you want? Should we? You want? We could take a minute to think about that, and let's get Jennifer's. Yeah, actually, that was exactly my question. You, you kind of teased that you had some policy to consider. Okay. You guys ready to answer those, or should we grab, grab another question? I, well, I can take a crack. So, uh, yeah, I teased. Uh, <laughs> we wrote a report. Um, in October 2018 called uh, From Resistance to Renewal, a 12-step program for innovation and inclusion in the California economy. Because uh, we think California needs to recover um, from its addiction to inequality, racism, and short-term thinking. Um, so let me lift up a couple of those things that I think are sort of really, uh, might, might make a difference in this particular arena. Uh, and I won't go through um, all 12. Um, one is, uh, it's something I did mention, which is to open up the workforce development system to the extent possible to everybody in California, regardless of immigration status. We're inevitably gonna have an immigration reform. The only question is whether or not the population we inherit is doing well in the economy. And I think another really important part of that, I've been glad to see the governor move forward with some steps on it, is to continue the health insurance expansion to all Californians, regardless of status. Second, uh, we need a very aggressive reentry program. We've made a, you know, when the rest of the nation uh, uh, jumped its state prison population by 400% between 1980 and 2008, horrible statistic, California went up by 600%. So we've created a population that's carrying uh, incarceration record, criminal justice record, all sorts of problems. We've made a big commitment to deincarceration. I hope we make an even bigger commitment to reentry, and including putting the kinds of requirements on public spending and publicly subsidized projects that say you really have to do um, this kind of work. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but just a, a couple of more. One, and I'm uh, going to put a couple of these together. Really glad to see Lenny here. Uh, I'm very glad about the state's commitment to understanding the geographic divide that has taken place in the state, where you literally, over the last 20 years, have seen incomes rise in the coast and incomes, median household incomes decline in inland California. Uh, and what that means is that we really need to address those geographic divides, and that means putting redevelopment and investment dollars into the Central Valley, into the Inland Empire, uh, in really uh, key ways. Um, that also means that in terms of adopting an overall economic development strategy for the state, beginning to think about advanced 
manufacturing and the way that it can generate jobs that actually exist in the middle um, and take advantage. I mean, we've, you know, we've got a large group of manufacturing employees. It's typical of the Midwest too, but here what's going on, I mean, we got hard hit by deindustrialization too. People forget about it um, because they forget that Los Angeles actually had a larger manufacturing sector than Detroit. Um, so it got really hard hit by aerospace. There's a lot of incumbent, older, white workers. Manufacturing is continuing to expand, but those workers are retiring. It creates a lot of opportunities to onboard African-American and Latino workers into manufacturing and to move it into advanced manufacturing. Last thing I'll say that I think is really crucial um, is the community college system. Um, and one of the things, if we went back to those charts, that you'll notice is that the only uh, education level that held its own was having an AA degree. And the education level where there's the least disparities between racial groups is the AA degree. And if you look at who's entering into the community college system now, it's young African Americans, uh, sons and daughters of immigrants, uh, you know, low income people, et cetera, who can't afford uh, the college debt. Community college is so important, not just for young people, but for workers that are gonna be continuing to retrain. Um, and I think, although we're doing better about putting more money into it, we need to put even more money into it and understand that they are centers for retraining as well. I've got lots of ideas on all sorts of other things because what else do academics do? But, <laughs> but dream up stuff other people should do. Um, let me say that I agree 100% with my colleague, <laughs> very smart and good friend, Manuel Pastor. Um, let me also say that, um, so the big minimum wage, I think that's you know a policy that we can, um, I, I won't say much more than that because it's already in the books. And so my one of the takeaways is to reconsider adding that. Um, but with regards to, um, just, just to just add um, or to further support um, the connection of workforce development and some of the um, um, research that we're currently undertaking to better understand um, how to connect work and workers. Um, and I think we need to open that door to this emerging population of highly educated, undocumented folks who are coming out of our um, higher um, ed system. Um, I don't think it's that difficult and I don't think it's um, such a large number that it's going to worry many folks. And you can even have a different sort of um, articulation. Um, there is a hierarchy as much as I hate um, privileging a certain group of undocumented um, young folks. Um, there is a policy road to help us think of even those without DACA or even lower skilled folks and connecting them um, to the labor market. And so um, that's what I would emphasize. Um, and again, this isn't anything new. There are folks who are already creating and thinking of a way to connect um, these young folks to our labor market. Um, I also think I'm um, paying attention to um, very specific work of um, black workers in Los Angeles. Um, we've put research out that has very specific recommendations that in part are holistic. That is, we need to deal with the growing push out of residents, longtime residents in Los Angeles who are being impacted by gentrification and other unfettered forces. That is pushing the problem, so to speak, to neighboring communities. And we have solutions and policies to stem some of that, um, including supporting Worker Center and other efforts that link, again, African-American displaced workers with a more robust market that is also shifting and moving. And so um, there are policies out there that I'm happy to share and leave with you um, that you can dive into. Fantastic. So we had Ash and then and then, uh, Saru. Thank you. Um, thank you both. Um, and uh, Professor uh, Valenzuela recently had a chance to go to UCLA Labor Center and learned about the extraordinary work they're doing. And so I appreciate you and everybody else as part of that. Uh, and also learned a lot about the building trades works on the reentry, as both of you have referred to reentry as an important uh, critical role. Um, and um, um, Professor uh, Pastor, I've seen you and, and heard you speak many times, including in the Silicon Valley, where folks will cheer your presentation and then fight every time we try to do something that actually implements what you're suggesting we should do. Um, and they fight minimum wage. 
Um, they're putting $110 million to create a second class citizenship of workers. And so my question is what, because one of the questions posed is what incentives or what can we do to encourage employers to not do a race to the bottom for 40 years? And I think that they're not gonna do it. I mean, for 40 years, they're, they've created the race to the bottom. So the question then is, what can we do really to deal with the racial disparity, the economic disparity that really is such a shame in the wealthiest state in the wealthiest country on earth? Um, and so, what, what, you know, how can we force the issue? It could be taxation policy, it could be a variety of different things in terms of hiring, blind hiring, I don't know, because again, for Silicon Valley, for 30 years has talked about not having a talent pool um, and yet has done nothing to actually create that talent pool to have more African-Americans, Latinos in those Silicon Valley companies where so many of people that live in my district, in East San Jose, live in the shadows of these trillion dollar companies and have no shot. Their kids have almost zero shot of walking through the front doors of those buildings with the job unless they're emptying waste baskets. And so what, are, what can we do to force the issue? Because I think that time's up. I mean, it's, they've had their chance. And so any thoughts on that? Great, so let's take the last couple questions. Uh, Saru, Betty, uh, go ahead, and then we're gonna just get together a few of them. We're already running over time and getting the signal, so not everyone who's already had their thing up will be able to throw in a question. We have to move these quick. Hello. <laughs> um, appreciate Abel bringing up, uh, continuing to raise the minimum wage, of course. Of course, that's super important in my life's work, so thank you for raising it. What we've seen in California, though, at least in the restaurant industry, is that if we continue to raise the minimum wage without paying attention to the racial inequity, it actually worsens the inequity, at least in the restaurant industry. Yeah. So um, in the restaurant industry, we have a significant segment of workers that are livable, livable wage jobs. They're fine dining server, bartender positions. They're held almost exclusively by white men. Uh, people of color are in lower paying segments of the industry, casual and fast food. They're also in lower paying positions. So they're, they're the runners and busters in back of the house, not the fine dining servers. And um, I do appreciate all the comments about workforce development. But as you know, Manuel, after years of doing workforce development with people of color to get them into those fine dining service jobs, we know that it's not enough because if employers don't change their behavior with regard to who they're hiring and what positions, you can train a million workers of color to be fine dining servers and they'll all become bussers. Uh, they all get hired as bussers and runners and never get to be fine dining servers. So um, we looked in particular at the Bay Area over many years and found that yes, we have higher wages in the Bay Area in the restaurant industry than anywhere else in the country, but we actually have the highest race wage gap between white workers and workers of color in the restaurant industry in the Bay Area of any region in the United States. It's twice the race wage gap of the restaurant industry of Houston, Texas. We are bad. We are in a bad place. Workers have higher wages, but the disparity is enormous. And so to my question, Anmol, when we looked at policy though, and we did a national scan of policy because of the US Supreme Court restrictions around dirty word, affirmative action, or quotas, or anything that would really help us actually push the industry to change. The only thing we ended up being able to come up with with regard to policy, we can, we're doing a lot of work with employers, we're doing a lot of work with workforce development, we're doing a lot of work with consumers even who have tremendous biases in this realm. But the only policy that we could find, that we could come up with after looking at so many different types of policies to address racial inequality that could couple with minimum wage, the only thing we ended up with was incentives policies to incentivize employers to desegregate, which is nice and good, and we're gonna talk about it today, and it's great, and of course, we're doing a lot of work on it, but we're doing it because it's the only policy that we could find that would work with the horrible US Supreme Court regime around reducing racial inequality. So really what I'd, I'd love to say beyond the incentives is what other policy solutions can we think of that could actually desegregate at scale and could be decoupled with a minimum wage increase so that as we raise wages, we're making sure it's for everybody and we're not increasing disparity. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna get, we're gonna get uh, Betty and Maria one as well and then um, the Madam Secretary has told me that to cut it there and hopefully give them a minute to respond to those, is that right? Yep. I believe you acknowledge that I was I in believe the queue. That I have to defer to the, the Secretary, but what, um, well, there's a lot of, so there's just a lot more than just these two that have asked questions. I know we're also over time, so 
we can should we take these two give them a chance to i think that's right and, and there's a break where you continue conversation yeah, and there will be other right? opportunities to raise yeah. issues yeah, yeah, yeah. um i'll explain this before we go into the next panel. got it go ahead. Okay. uh betty great thank yeah. you um we had at our last commission meeting a presentation by dr william edmonds who talked about this concept of a wealth premium and how really it's in, indistinguishable with respect to that premium when you look at a household headed up by someone with a bachelor's degree and someone who doesn't have a bachelor's degree. And I guess my question really is, um, are we, uh, is one of the ways to get at this racial gap really about access to skills development and you know, how, to, how to be ready to enter into these emerging uh, types of industries that you're talking about? Um, Professor Valenzuela, with respect to, for example, here in Los Angeles, the creative industry, which I think could provide some lucrative opportunities, but um, it seems to me that there are kind of some access point issues and, and uh, the community college um, issue is exactly, I think, uh, something that we need to focus on. But uh, I think there's some policies embedded around that. That um, Can you speak to that? Because um, I just think that what we talked about relative to the value of a college degree um, may have a relationship to Manuel's point about aggressive reentry, and um, I think there might be a way to kind of um, really address the, the racial disparity if we are able to think about, you know, what are those types of programs that are aggressive at the ready and really are preparing people to access some of these emerging industries. Thank you, and Maria. My question was probably going to be in line with that because it was picking up on your point about about the community college system because I think at least my experience and what I've seen is a great partnership between business and the community colleges. And just wondering your thoughts on policies that could further that type of collaboration that in my opinion could lead to a stronger and a greater workforce. So maybe just building off on Betty's question. Great. Thank you, then Doug for 30 seconds and these two for one minute each, done. Thank you. Um, I just would like you to comment on Proposition 209, which for folks don't know, prohibited state and local government from being able to consider ethnicity uh, and race when doing hiring, doing contracting, and doing it in education as well. And for many generations of African American workers and other workers of color, getting jobs in the public sector or getting contracts for small businesses was a path to the middle class. Great. All right, you guys good with a minute each? Sure, I'll try to go really fast. Um, <laughs> affirmative action, I'm a proud recipient. It's on my forehead, AA. I went to UC Berkeley and um, I remember quite well um, having a, a, a conference at, UC, at UCLA shortly after my hire about the stigma of affirmative action. I would have no major issues um, bringing back some sort of a renaming um, to connect certain folks. Um, but I think it's more consistent with what I want to leave as my closing comment about a sector oral approach. We know the growth industry is quite clearly in California and in Los Angeles, and we know the different occupations, and we know the mismatch, right? And so um, having um, skills-focused um, trainings, but connections between workers and the sectoral or these industries that are growing um, makes sense to me as a form of intervention to start linking some of these disparities. Um, and again, thinking a little bit out of the box innovatively um, about sorts of quota programs. Again, not even calling them that, but not being afraid of moving forward in a more directed approach to tackle inequities by race and um, immigration and other gender and other statuses. So thanks for the one minute to address the imbalance of power between <laughs> capital and labor. <laughs> to discuss how to desegregate at scale and how to create collaboration between systems that are often misaligned. Uh, so on the balance of power, you know, you're exactly right. I mean, I think the kinds of things that you can think about as part of an economic policy, how do you further promote unionization as a balance of power within the state of California? How do you do the kind of work that Rock has done with regard to figuring out high road businesses and promoting them? Uh, that's not the be all end all, uh, but it is an important part to celebrate the businesses that are doing the right thing. 
how can you consider wage boards as part of the California Industrial Welfare Commission so that you could take areas that are not currently unionized and actually put together collectivities of workers and firms to try to set the needs for that, which by the way, could filter very well into what are the training needs as well for some of the industries that are less well articulated right now with the community college system, health care industry is very well, but some other industries um, are not. Um, I uh, agree uh, about the need to overturn uh, Proposition 209 and to really come up with ways that can actually uh, desegregate at scale, at scale. It's not just a skill gap, it's also a way in which, as I mentioned, there's active discrimination in labor markets, and it also leads to an assumption about who you're gonna hire, who then never gets that position to acquire the skills. And I know at least some of you around this table who have done the kind of hiring that brings somebody in that didn't look like they were your typical candidate and have turned out to be the strength of your bench moving forward. I wanna leave you <laughs> with one, less demograph one last demographic fact, because what would a Manuel Pastor talk be without demography? Um, when people think about demographic change in most of the rest of the United States, they're thinking about the United States becoming majority people of color. We did that in 1988, 1999, and actually our ethnic demographic change is slowing down. If you want to ask what does California look like in 30 years ethnically, it looks kind of like we do right now. Here's what's going to be different. In 2010, 11% of Californians were 65 years old or older. In the year 2060, 26% of Californians will be 65 years old or older. Part of the reason why, people forgot. Latinos and African Americans we also age. <laughs> it's a little known fact. Uh, but what that means is we need to develop a caring economy. We need to be creating flex time for workers, paid time off to be able to deal with elders and the young, improving conditions in the caring economy for those who care so that the wages will go up, the training will be there. And one of the central things you could do to take what is now called low-skilled work. But my God, do you really want to leave your elders with someone who has no skills? You know that they have tremendous skills. They're just not well-paid. So how do we really focus moving forward? This is kind of a long-term thing, I think, for the governor and the state on improving the conditions in the caring economy. And apparently millennials are quite consistent in their agreement with the uh, caring and a more inclusive economy that it also includes flex um, schedules and similar. So that, yeah. that would be something that would be more um, embracing of others. So Yeah, and that's such a great way to bring this together because this is something that has come up, I think, in every single convening that we've, that we've had so far, a, a discussion around the care economy specifically. I think of the industries and the workers who work in the care economy and provide care, but then I think what I heard also there was also a nod to a, a caring policy as well, right, for all workers and for everyone who was, in, even people who are retired and who are no longer working, but to the benefit of all who live in California. So thank you guys so much, and I appreciate all the... So thank you so much. What a wonderful way to kick off the day. We are actually going to just allow people to stand up, stretch, use the restroom. If you do not need to, we'll ask you to stay put because we're just going to change the, um, the, the name cards and go to our second and final panel of the day. And go ahead and start moving, but I just want to say...
second most difficult part of a day is to stop a break. And so I appreciate everyone coming back. And so we we're gonna try and leave as much time as possible for this conversation. I'm gonna do very brief opening remarks. We'll ask each of our panelists to give uh, five to seven minute opening remarks and we'll have plenty of time for Q and A after that. So thank you again for coming back uh, so promptly and apologize for the short break. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit and have a conversation from an employer perspective. Lance raised in the early part of the conversation about it, importance of having voices of businesses who are the people who are out trying to make all of this work and meet a payroll. And so what we'd like to do is have a conversation from two really terrific panelists who are gonna help bring that perspective. Uh, first, Mark Herbert, who's the Vice President of California Small Business Majority, had the pleasure of working with Small Business Majority in a number of activities across the state and they're very, very, um, informed, fact-based, and a very thoughtful perspective on how do small businesses operate, and it's a key part of the California economy. So Mark, thank you for joining us. And after him, we will followed by Pamela Kahn, who is the president of, of Bishop Wise Carver, who is a fantastic manufacturing company in Pittsburgh, California, who I had the pleasure of having a tour of your facility a little bit earlier this year, and a great family history of trying to make fantastic products and make that operate in a challenging globally oriented industry in the California economy. And so she'll be able to tell us what it's like to actually make that work. So with that, let me start with you, Mark, please go ahead. Thank you, Lenny. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's an honor and pleasure to be here uh, on behalf of Small Business Majority. Um, so I'm our vice president here in California. And really, Small Business Majority is founded on the belief that entrepreneurs and small employers are really essential building blocks to healthy, sustainable, thriving local communities. Um, and therefore, uh, those entrepreneurs uh, deserve all the tools that they need to be successful. And we also believe that there's this authentic voice of small business that exists in public policy, but it's just often underrepresented in some conversations. And we wanna make sure that that voice is part of those policy conversations. So we do a lot, as, uh, as Lenny mentioned, in terms of the, the data that we use, we do a lot of uh, um, uh, polling. So this is scientific opinion polling. It's not, we don't ask our folks what they think of public policy. We actually hire a polling company to do, go do a poll of small business owners so that we can get a sense of this is what the majority of small business owners are thinking. Um, this is, these are the policy solutions that they're really looking to uh, pursue. Um, and so we wanna make sure that that voice is part of the conversation. So I thought I'd just quickly frame out here in California, we have about 4 million small business owners across all sorts of industries. Um, roughly 700,000 of those uh, have employees. Um, and uh, the average income for an incorporated small business owner is around $60,000 a year. So uh, small business owners are a, a part of the economy. Um, uh, many of them are not in the si six uh, figure category. And many of these small business owners are, are in our local communities. And we know that uh, we care deeply about small uh, business ownership and employee and entrepreneurship because the data shows that when you have a higher per capita of business ownership and entrepreneurship in local communities. You get higher wages, you get higher uh, growth, uh, and you get better jobs. And so we wanna make sure that entrepreneurs have the tools that they need to be able to grow their businesses. We also know that roughly two thirds of all the jobs since the Great Recession have been created by small employers. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we're identifying where the new job slots are coming from, and then what are we doing to encourage the uh, additional job creation opportunities, as well as making sure that those jobs are quality jobs. Uh, and specifically here in California, it's businesses that have less than 20 employees are the ones that are creating most of the net new jobs. Um, and uh, wanna just, and, and so sort of the last sort of piece on sort of the, the data framing is that um, roughly half, a little less than half, of the entire private sector labor force work for small businesses. So if we're gonna talk about the future of work and of workers and the future of our economy, we have to figure out how to right size solutions for small employers uh, and their employees. Um, but we know small business ownership is tough. Um, often you start a small business because you have a passion about some, uh, about, uh, um, uh, about some, some, some endeavor, uh, whether it's starting a restaurant, starting a bakery, um, and chances are you're not an HR expert, probably not a finance expert, but you wear many, of, many hats when you're trying to do that. But you also really love your business, and we find that many small business owners, because they love their business, really have a unique connection and relationship with many of their employees, 
So we think of a business, a small business is less than 100. 96% of businesses in California have less than 50. So the vast majority of businesses here in the state are much smaller. But as these employers are hiring folks to work with them on their baby, there's a unique connection and conversation that often happens. And I've had conversations with employers who uh, buy up their health benefits, not because they need it, but because one of their employees has a chronic condition, right? Or they're trying to figure out how do I make sure that there's some sort of benefit for pay leave available for my employees. So there's a unique sort of conversation, a unique relationship that we've seen in our conversations with small businesses uh, because these employees are a massive part of their labor force. You have 10 employees, one employee is a big deal for your ability as a business to be successful. And you wanna make sure that that employee has the tools that they need to be successful. So our polling shows that small business owners on aggregate, well, we know generally from the data that small businesses on aggregate don't offer benefits at, uh, at nearly the same rates as much larger companies. But it's not because business owners don't want to. Um, oftentimes, it's just really challenging. And, and roughly speaking, there are a lot of challenges with small business owners, but roughly speaking, the, sort of th the three main challenges that we see with small business owners when they're trying to figure out you know, can I get health insurance? Do I need to get retirement from my employees? How do I make sure that they can have paid time off and paid sick days? And how do I make all these pieces of the puzzle work? Um, there's sort of three basic barriers. So one is cost, right? How much is this going to cost me? What's this mean for my bottom line? How am I going to make payroll? Two is administrative complexity, right? If if, I, if I'm an expert at running a bakery, uh, you know, how much more of a burden on my time is wearing this HR hat going to cost me? Like, how am I going to figure this out? Um, and three is liability, right? Is there some sort of liability issue here that I may not know? I'm not a lawyer, uh, and I just want to make sure that my business is safe and protected as I continue to grow. So as you also think about solutions and right-sizing those solutions for small employers, I would encourage you to think about those three barriers um, as, uh, as needs to address in thinking through policy solutions. And I just want to, before I finish, I just want to end on one, uh, there was a great conversation in the previous panel uh, around uh, equity uh, and diversity in hiring. Um, and we did some polling a few years ago uh, that actually showed um, who the business owner is matters quite a bit. Women-owned businesses in this polling that we've done a number of years ago that we hope to do again soon, um, roughly 80% of those businesses are more likely to hire other women. Entrepreneurs of color are between 40 and 50% more likely to hire other people of color. So when we think about how are we empowering entrepreneurs and small business owners um, to create opportunities in their communities, we want to make sure that we are identifying uh, that piece of the puzzle in this conversation as well. So really excited to be here. Uh, really appreciate all the very hard work that you have done and that you will need to continue to do in the future and uh, look forward to the conversation. Great, thank you. And we'll have a number of questions. I'll ask a couple because there were other things that we talked about that I want to make sure we get. But we'll, let me turn it over to Pamela. Can I get my slides? Great. So I'm Pamela Kahn. I'm the president of Bishop Wisecarver. I'm second generation owner of the company. My dad started the business uh, in 1950. As you heard, we're located in Pittsburgh, California. That causes us some issues. We're without the H. Um, and I have three older brothers, so actually I'm in a role I didn't think I'd ever be in, to be honest. So, um, oh, I guess I got this here. Uh, whoops. Um, how do I advance here? There we go. All right. So there is my dad uh, on the left, Bud well known in the Bay Area. Um, he's of that generation that loved to make things. And as you can see here, he, uh, we made a lot of um, machinery um, for like level or blinds and standard oil and all of that. And what we do now is we make um, actuators. So we're in industrial automation. Uh, think of an MRI. The bed goes in, that slides back and forth, that's linear actuators. The magnet spins around to do the imaging, that's rotary. I sell both forms of actuations to OEM. So I don't necessarily make the whole machine, but I help the machine move. So that's what we do. And uh, there's my one of my last pictures with my dad, actually out on the floor, he's 91. Um, so he doesn't come to work anymore. Um, all right, why am I having such an issue? All right, 
So um, one of the things I wanted to talk about from a small business perspective is just the increasing burden that we have in doing the training, all training, basic training, how to do math, everything for, the t for our employees. Um, so we, have, uh, we do have a union out on the floor. We're still workers international for um, our floor. Um, but I, steel workers, SWI, yeah. So, you know, on average, basically the first two weeks is pretty much solid <laughs> education just to get someone basic on the floor. Um, and there's, you know, increasing training requirements by state and federal. We've actually started our own internal university to uh, invest and train in our uh, employees. So we uh, just find that it's it's harder and harder. We really can't find quote unquote turnkey employees for almost any type of job that we hire for. So the burden is pretty much 100% on us to train any of our employees. Um, we rely heavily, I liked the previous panel, on community colleges and our junior colleges. Uh, we were very involved at DVC in the machinist program. They took it away, now they brought it back, we're involved there. Um, I think I really liked how you said right size. I think one thing to think about is, um, so for us, we're out by Los Madanos. Los Madanos actually doesn't offer the type of training my workers need. My workers would need to actually go to Laney. Like Mark Martin does a fabulous job at Laney. Um, the problem is trainings during the day. Uh, when you don't have a lot of employees, <laughs> you can't take them off. So when do I need them to go get training? I need them to get training at night and on the weekends because we run really flat. We have to be highly efficient to be here in California. And I don't have a lot of depths of workers. A lot of, a lot of the stations are a one worker station. And if I take somebody out to send them to a program, there's no production. And I have to keep production going. So that would be sort of a right size thing to think about. Uh, why is this having so many issues? All right. So actually, as Lenny said, he was out uh, visiting us. Um, we've been really involved in um, manufacturing day uh, from the very beginning. It started actually on social media and it was a virtual thing and then it became a real thing and we've done it every single year. Uh, we had close to 300 students come through our facility this year and it's really a strong passion of mine to spread the word around manufacturing and I'll get into some of the data in the next slide. Um, there's my team at the East Bay Innovation Awards, really proud of uh, my team and um, that was around a new product that we designed. And then you can see my whole team and you can see, yes, we're um, a dog friendly environment, not out on the production floor, but. Um, so here are some of the data. I don't want to spend too much time on this because everyone has access to these slides. Um, I actually want to highlight, um, piggyback on something that Mark said. Um, you know, in, in manufacturing, uh, almost over 350,000 manufacturers across the country are actually sole proprietors. It's exactly what Mark was talking about. And then when it comes to small business, over 183,000 are 20 employees or less. Um, I'm at 60, so I'm just over that kind of that horizon you were talking about. Um, but even then, there's only 61,000 manufacturers that are 20 to 499 employees. And then you get the small amount above that of 500 and more, and that's less than 4,000. I think though there's a perception that every manufacturer is like a Lockheed Martin or General Motors, and it's not. The heart of manufacturing is actually 10 employees or so. Very small, but we do, we keep everything going. So. Um, I am also certified woman-owned, so I'm very passionate about women in manufacturing and changing some of these numbers about getting more diversity into manufacturing and keeping girls involved in STEM-based ed education. Um, it's, it's really sad to see the abandonment rate 
of girls going through school, and they need to stay involved in STEM. Um, so here are two of my employees. So Elena on the left, she's actually my manufacturing engineer. She does a great job. And Quentin on the right, he's out in um, production. And um, this is part of a campaign that's up in Sacramento in the Senate. And so I'm just really proud of, of my team and the diversity of my team. And um, you can read why they love being in manufacturing. So, um, so like I was saying, I think what I think what employers need are help with the training. Um, I think community colleges and and like I said, the junior colleges do great work, but most of it really has to happen in house. So we have to think about those policies that incentivize or help the small employers take on the burden of the training and all the training costs. Um, like I, I'm, like I said, we need to increase STEM education, but not, but also I find what we need to do is bring back the ability to have applied learning. We're very involved in FIRST Robotics. I've been a national and local support, um, supporter of FIRST Robotics for over a decade. Um, what Dean came in and Woody Flowers have done is, is, is amazing. Um, I can't tell you how many times I hear from the kids that I sponsor, and I make it important to sponsor all female robotic teams. I've also sponsored teams from continuation schools. And it was actually out of a continuation school on Treasure Island. One of these kids, hardcore gang member kind of kid, actually said, I actually didn't see a purpose to my life. But now I've been a part of a team I've built something, and now I can start to see that I actually can contribute, and there's a value to me going to school. I mean, that's amazing. That's what we need to be installing in the next generation of our kids, and we need to tell them and show them why education matters. And when they can touch it and feel it and work in teams, it really does make a huge difference. Um, so, <laughs> we need a 40-hour week. <laughs> Don't know what else to say. And I will tell you, probably the largest uh, request to go to a 40-hour week versus an eight-hour day, like our state has for manufacturing, um, is my union labor. They tend to be some of my younger employees. They have kids. Um, they want flex time. And... Once again, if you're a small employer, it's the cost of doing flex time with an eight hour day versus a 40 hour week, it's too punitive as much as you wanna do it. But I think this is a holdover from the way work was done decades ago. And it's not the way we work anymore. And it's not the way we live, live our lives. And our state is always being very proud about being at the head of things. We need to follow the rest of the country and have a 40-hour week. Um, regulation. Um, so I'm a manufacturer, as you saw. <laughs> and I love California. Family came here in a wagon from Iowa in 1853. We've been here for generations. I want clean water. I want clean air. I want all of that. I struggle with the fact that if I want a plate my product, which you need to do for industrial applications, I can't do it here. You know, with the free board, I'm not going to get into it and all of that. I can't plate my product in California because of environmental regulations. But you know what I have to do? Put it on a truck and truck it to Oregon. Get it plated, put it on a truck, and bring it back. I struggle with that one because I think that's actually probably worse environmental impact than if I could get it plated or coated here in California or the Bay Area. So um, it's a tough place to be. I love California. I love coming back here when I come. I travel a lot. Um, but I will tell you, everybody wants me to move my business somewhere else. Uh, anytime at a, any type of a meeting, trade association, trade show, um, everybody from that state wants to tell me why to move. 
And I'll tell you, it's it's harder and harder to get to to be here. Uh, I have had customers flat out say, I will not buy from you. And I ask them why, and they say, because you're in California. And if you're in California, I'm paying too much for your product, period. And so, I mean, you ha we have to think about the impact of all these regulations and things. I know, I know each one individually, there's good behind it, but when you stack it up, you have to look at the disadvantage you're creating for many of the companies, especially when they're small, to actually compete. And I complete, I sell globally, not just in California. So I'm competing against other states. I'm competing against the people who are copying my product in China. And, and so I have to figure out how do I stay here and actually compete? Because when you all are buying something, you probably look for the cheapest price. And so do the buyers that I sell to. So it makes it tough. And I think that's it. So thank you. Great. Thank you. I'm just going to ask a couple questions, so please be ready if you want to put your 10 cards up. And I see Senator Granholm and Lance already. OK, so I'm going to ask one quick question then so I can get to all of your questions. So. Um, and I'll ask you, you, Mark, generally on your surveys and Pam on your, your specific business. So why are you in California? Why are businesses in California? Go ahead. How you go? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think there are a, a number of reasons. One is um, many small, it, it depends on the industry, right? I mean, we know that small business growth uh, tracks generally with sort of industry growth um, in the region. So. Um, the, the place and the location of that small business connected to the larger industries that surround it is essential for the growth of that business. So as we have industry clusters that uh, where there's intentional investment, intentional growth, you're going to see small businesses connected to those industry clusters. And so um, the choices of those small businesses to stay are that this is where those industries are and this is where I can see, see my growth. I think also um, something to mention is that um, there are uh, really unique uh, benefits that exist for some small employers or many small employers in terms of offering their employees that I just want to highlight. One is that um, we actually have a functioning and robust uh, individual insurance marketplace through Cover California. We know that small employers who are less than 50, uh, they don't have to offer insurance, um, but they can if they'd like to. And so there's an option to sort of buy up. Um, and we've actually done the Affordable Care Act right here in California in many ways. There's still challenges. And this governor has taken huge steps to make it even more affordable uh, for individuals who work in small, uh, small businesses as well as entrepreneurs themselves. So when you have a marketplace that allows an entrepreneur to know, if I start my business, I can still get affordable insurance. If I'm growing my business and I'm not quite there yet to be able to offer insurance, I know my, my employees can get insurance. That's very attractive, especially as you think about the really small businesses and, and their desire to take care of their employees. Uh, we also have a statewide uh, paid leave program that is administered by the state. So that takes the administrative burden off of small employers. Um, it's employee funded. It's not costing the employers anything. Um, and it's something that uh, small employers don't really know about in general. We, we talk to them quite a bit about it so that they understand there's this unique benefit that they have. But that's something that's valuable that they embrace and say, this is, this is a great opportunity for me to, to really own this and say, this is a great benefit that a small business and an employee here in California. And then last, I also mentioned a really exciting program, CalSavers. Uh, so CalSavers is a retirement product uh, that's going to be portable, uh, that's going to be, that's, that rolled out uh, this year. Uh, so an employer of five or more um, will have, uh, won't have to pay for a retirement product for their employees, uh, won't have to administer the, re the retirement product, um, and they're not uh, liable, the fiduciary liability, right? Those three sort of challenges. So a small business owner here in California, just by existing in California because of the framework around it, actually is able to offer um, a little bit higher quality of job than exists in other states, right? And there's there's value to that, and that's something that many small business owner, owners understand. Um, you know, but but to mention, right, the administrative complexity is still a challenge. And so, as you think about moving forward, um, I would also encourage, um, uh, as we think about solutions in those three barriers, think about uh, how are how are we not leveraging technology to solve those barriers and how could we right i think there are incredible opportunities Techno tech has done a really good job of thinking about the consumer market how are we solving convenience in the consumer market you know but i think there how are we solving 
cost, administrative complexity, and liability in the small business market, right? How, what are the public-private partnerships that we need to drive those solutions? And how can we make sure that the quality of job that's uh, supported by existing in California is actually uh, reducing burdens on small businesses and continues to be more attractive? Okay, great. Thank you, Pam. Well, I think I already answered it right now. It's a, it's a family thing. You know, we've been here for decades. My dad built the company. Um, we have a lot of land. I mean, we own our, our building and our land. So moving is a little bit tough for us. Um, so, I mean, that's why we are here. Another program I'd like to give a shout out to, which I always call the best kept secret in California, is ETP. Um, Whenever I talk about ETP, I have a line of people um, after the meeting saying, oh, what is this program? And I've never heard about it. Um, so I think that's something that more small businesses need to know about ETP. But I think we also need to make it um, easier to access. Uh, the, the access is quite complex to get your ETP dollars. Go ahead. Just, just to add to that, I think that's an excellent point. I mean, I think, so the ETP is the employment training panel. So these are... Uh, state dollar, or these are uh, employer dollars that are going into a program that then allow training uh, and upskilling within uh, within businesses. Um, it, it can be challenging from the administrative end of it to uh, get those dollars because the reimbursement window is really long. Um, the application process can sometimes be challenging. Um, and it can be really tough for really small businesses because yeah. um, oftentimes you need a consultant to come and do the application for you. Um, and sometimes there are these, uh, uh, they're called multi, multiple, multi-employer plans that some workforce boards run to try to get more yeah. small businesses plugged in. Um, but again, right, I think that's a, that's a real, it's a really great program that gets yeah. dollars back into training. Um, and uh, in any way that we can continue to address those challenges that small business owners have in accessing that, right? What are the technology solutions? What are the policy solutions? Um, it's a great program that really, I think, um, could use uh, additional support, yeah. Okay, great. Now we're going to go to questions, and here's what I'm going to do so you can take your cards down. I've got the ones who have had them. We're going to, I'm going to take two at a time, and then we'll have them respond. So I've got, uh, in the order that I received them, Governor Granholm, Lance, I've got Carla and Roy, and I've got John and Doug, and then Faye. Okay? So, Governor. Um, thanks so much. Um, I'm the former governor of Michigan, and Pam, I would have been on your doorstep to get you to come to Michigan. And I kid you not, I came to okay. California... Michigan has already. I, bet, to I, I, I have no doubt. And I, when I was governor, I would come to California, Lenny, and I would say to these startups in particular, you, you've got a great product. You're not going to take it to scale here. There's no way you can afford to do that. Come to Michigan. We will make you an offer you can't refuse. We'll give you free land. We'll help to <laughs> subsidize your building. We will do whatever it takes to get you here. It is an issue that California, I, I've been curious about, how businesses choose to stay in light of the costs here. It's so ridiculously expensive. Granted, you get great employees. So first question is to you, because you were saying, Pam, about training. Yeah. What if the state offered some kind of subsidized training that allowed for you to be able to hire people and work them alongside folks in your work, but allowed them to actually be paid initially by the state, but in a gradation, and eventually you absorb the cost of it because you've decided to keep them on. What if the state offered something like that? Would that help to relieve some of your concerns? Number number yeah. one. Yeah. Um, and then the second thing is, along the lines of what you were saying regarding portable benefits, mm -hmm. um, I don't understand why California has not leveraged their platform economy to create a, a portable benefit system. Yeah. It's much more robust than what exists. You could totally be leading. I, I don't know who can answer that, yeah. but would that also be something that would help to, um, to attract and retain businesses in California? Okay, great. Thank you. And we're glad you're in California and recruiting companies to California now. So, <laughs> Lance. I, I do think the state needs to get creative about the the training whether it's a funded sort of like apprentice style co-op style of training whether it's like r d and you get training credits and tax credits for spending on training but i i think there's a there's a lot of things that we could do i'd be definitely interested in it i mean devil's in the details so i mean how it gets administered and what would be required but i mean that's definitely something I would be interested in. Um, 
I don't know if I'm the one to speak to the portability of, of benefits. I, I would tell you that the one thing that um, I think is a disservice to workers from being was at this, on the state um, workforce development board for quite a few years is the lack of portability around um, the training and like the, the certificates and that. So, you know, you're in the, down in the Inland Empire and you go through a specific um, program to be a welder or something for like Northrop Grumman, but there's no portability of that. You come up and then to the Bay Area and Chevron doesn't recognize that training program. Like that's a disservice. That's a disservice to people who have spent time going through and getting training. We need, we need a flatter type of a, um, system that allows the, the portability for the worker to be able to work at least anywhere within the state. I mean, even better to be able to go outside of that, but you see very tight um, training that happens that doesn't allow portability. Okay, hold on, Ansel. Let me let, let Lance get in as well, and then you can answer. Thank you very much. And I just want to say to the commissioners and the, the publics here and the folks that are watching on the internet, um, what you're witnessing right now is the future or the present and future narrative of the manufacturing sector right in front of you. Pamela Kahn represents more manufacturers in concept and in practice than you could possibly imagine. There are 30,000 manufacturers in California, 95% at least of those are small to medium sized manufacturers. She just presented to you the daily challenges of what she faces just to make things here in California. And the, the, one of the reasons why you know, Pamela is so fantastic is the authenticity with which she brings the information to the table. This is a family business. It's not that large manufacturer that people think, Hollywood thinks, others think is the manufacturing sector. And here in Los Angeles, since we're here, job growth rate in the manufacturing sector is negative. It's down 7%. Primarily made up of small and medium manufacturers, they're facing the challenges that she described in order to keep their doors open, keep people employed, and keep making things, which of course, as you know, creates wealth for our economy and the communities and the workers. So within this context are a bunch of solutions that we need to talk about. We've been focusing a lot on the employer-employee dynamic, but some attention needs to be focused on those who actually provide the jobs. So what we're trying to solve, I think, as a commission is a multi-dimensional, I was gonna say three-dimensional, but it's probably a four-dimensional equation that we're trying to solve here. But hearing the perspective um, of both panelists this morning has been helpful, but you know, file this away. This is the new narrative of the manufacturing sector. It's not dirty, dark, and dangerous like it once was. It's not that way anymore. So the, the more that we can all understand what we've come to know in our sector, I think the, the, the better off we'll all be as a commission. I'm sorry there's not a question in there, but I, I did want to offer that okay. up. Okay, thank you. So then why don't we let um, Mark answer the portability question, and then I will go to um, Carla and Roy. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, yes, I mean, I think there's incredible opportunity to really explore portability. Um, but I think there's also um, a way to think about what we already have, and and how do we think about um, how do we think about addressing all the different sort of benefits that are out there? Whether it's paid leave, right? That's through EDD. We have Cover California. That's its own thing. Cal Savers is the, you know through the Treasury Department and Control Ease, uh, uh, is on the on the board and and runs that. And so, right? How are how are we thinking about all the different departments that are out there that have a piece of what? of a benefit already, um, and then what are we doing to right-size this for a small manufacturer? Like, what are we doing to use technology to make that easier? And, and I do want to just touch on, on Commissioner Hastings' uh, co uh, comments, because small manufacturers are training the workforce of tomorrow because they have to, <laughs> right? They are doing this training, and so what are we, how does our workforce system support the manufacturers in the training they're doing. Like ETP is a great program. So maybe there are ways to think about um, putting money in at the front to make it easier to, to make that happen, right? Maybe that's the policy lever and maybe we figure out how to make that work. But um, small, many small businesses and other industries are training the workforce of tomorrow in many different ways. So how are we leveraging what's already happening and supporting that and, and encouraging that in a way that fits into the broader, into the broader frame? Okay. Thank, can I just ahead. address yeah, the go one thing I do want to say, and I know this is probably not <laughs> political thing to say, is that I think we overemphasize four-year schools. And I see that as well in the kids. It's really 
for some kids, especially if they want to make things, and I think if you looked, looked at the data, manufacturing pays really well, it pays better than the service jobs you've been talking about. And if you have a kid who loves to make things, you shouldn't tell them that he can't support a family or she on making things because they can, and but they don't need to go to a four-year school. I mean, and that's the other reason why we the, there's so much burden for training on us because kids are dropping out instead because they figure, I'm not going to go to a four-year school. I'm just going to drop out. We should keep them engaged. We, we shouldn't see that as tracking them, and we should encourage them to do the type of jobs that they want to do because they can get paid very well to do those type of jobs. Great. Carla and then Roy. Thank you for the great presentation. Uh, just two questions. One on the topic of uh, kind of basic job prep and maybe reflecting on the issue of incarceration. What are, what are the issues for you on just people coming in the door? What, what are the training and preparation issues that you face? Are you able to get the right people in the door? Should we be doing more around that? And is incarceration a barrier to that? Um, and then second, just you've mentioned a lot of things around training and upward mobility, ETP, and, you know, the efforts you're making, et cetera. I guess I'm wondering, you know, if I'm working in food service and I want to get into manufacturing, like, how would I do, you know, what, so I'm, I'm just interested in, like, what are the really practical barriers and then opportunities where we could make a difference in trying to help people who are already in the economy but maybe want to get into your, uh, you know, your sector and, um, and move on, move up. And maybe as you reflect on this, I, I appreciate you've already said a few, few of these, but what's working well? You know, where do you see think bright spots that are working that we could do more of? Why don't you ask yours now and then we'll do them, combine them. Sure. <clears throat> I see a puzzle, which is we've had this tremendous economic growth in the state, and the previous session reminded us of all the ways in which lower wage workers are struggling. And yet, you know, some of the message I'm hearing from you about employers is that employers are struggling too. And so who, who if not employers, is succeeding? You know, if you believe that workers should have higher wages, what do you see as employers' role in it? And in particular, I think it'd be great to get your reactions to policy proposals you may have heard earlier or things you think this commission might be likely to recommend that you think may be a bad idea that you want to anticipate, but just getting you to reflect on the role of the employer in raising wages for workers would be terrific. Okay. Thank you. Great. Pam, do you want to answer the first set of ones from oh, Carla? Okay. Um, shoot. I'm trying to read my own notes. Um, well... First off, you need them to show up for the interview. And I will tell you, that's actually an interesting struggle, <laughs> is to actually get them to come to the interview and, and do all of that. Let's, let's just take your question of food to manufacturing. I think one of the things that needs to happen is that the message from the state and from the media needs to be that manufacturing isn't dead. Because what they actually hear is that manufacturing's dying, that it's a dark, dirty, dingy job, um, and it's not any place that somebody would want to work. It's one reason why I'm really passionate about Manufacturing Day and getting people to come in and see my facility, and it's bright, and it's clean, and it's an engaging place to be, and we use lots of technology. Uh, it's very engaging. But I think that's part of the narrative, is to actually tell people that it is a very viable long-term career you can go after. Um, like I said, we're gonna train most of the people who come to us. They're gonna start out in production, production first class. We're gonna train them and we're gonna work them up through the system. Okay. Yeah, um, you know, I think, um, uh, what we've what we heard uh, consistently, also just sort of from the front end hiring piece, um, is the the challenge as you sort of articulated that we all sort of know is as a small business owner, like I, I can do a lot of the technical training in, in house, like I can get them to do that. Um, I just I just want someone who wants to come and work and mm -hmm. and be and be here and present and sort of have that that framework. And so I think um, thinking about um, 
yeah, think, thinking about sort of how our education system and workforce development programs are addressing that big challenge, essential skills, whatever you want to call it, I think is, I mean, it's always something, it's, it's sort of broken record, everyone always talks about it, um, but I still think it's something that is needs to be part of the conversation. Um, you know, I, I think in terms of thinking about, um, you know, uh, increasing wages and I mean really when I think that it's essential that we have a conversation about what that floor is right like what is that floor for folks whether it's wages whether it's benefits um, but I think it's it needs to be coupled with also a conversation of how are we empowering entrepreneurs and really small businesses with right size solutions to, to have them get there I know, I know from a lot of the conversations that I've had anecdotally with small business owners even around the minimum wage there are many small business owners who are not upset about the minimum wage being increased. Um, there are many who say, um, you know, I have to keep my wages competitive, right? I can pay maybe a little bit above, but I have to be competitive. I'm not competitive. Um, I'm not going to have a business. And so I want to figure out how, how far can I push that? Um, the main thing we hear from small employers around the increasing minimum wage is just, can you help me? figure out how to absorb that cost through my business. Do I need to increase that product more? Do I need to change this, this workflow policy? Are there some technology solutions that are gonna reduce my costs so that those, that money can go back to, to, to wages? So I think um, they're, they're not, all not all employers are made equal, right? There are some that are looking for ways to, to um, race to the bottom, but um, based on our polling and our data and what we see, um, the vast majority are not, and the vast majority are looking for solutions to be empowered to create a, a uh, opportunities, especially small employers, because of that unique dynamic that you have. And so I think the way the floor conversation on wages has to happen. And then the last piece is as a small business owner, um, you're, you are to some degree constrained by your industry in terms of wages, right? In terms of if I'm in an industry that happens to be a low wage industry, um, I can push as hard as I can for me. Uh, but at the same time, I, I've talked to many small business owners that they're pricing their way, they are, they are pricing their products above market rate by a little bit because they want to make sure that they are trying to attract better talented folks and so are paying folks more. Um, but it's still technically low wage because that's the industry they're in. So is, so you have to have a conversation about the wage floor, but I think you also have to think about what are the empowering tools that are going to allow folks to get to solutions. Uh, for me, let me grow. That's how I pay people more. So as I grow as a company and I expand and I have more jobs and I can have more layers, I can pay people more and I can retain and engage them. So, I mean, when we were 20 employees, I didn't have... 40 of the people I had now. I didn't have some of the higher level jobs that I had now. And my goal is to retain and attract and engage my employees. And I do that because as we grow, I can challenge them. I can grow them up into higher level jobs. And when I can grow them up into higher level jobs, I pay them more. That's how, and that's how I grow. So it's, it's, it's all an ecosystem. Okay. Um, John and then Doug. Great, thank you very much uh, for this panel. I really appreciate uh, both of your perspectives. Um, I wanted to pick up on the point, Pamela, that you had raised a second ago about this narrative that manufacturing is dying. And you know, I think you know, certainly this commission has been exposed to some research that suggests you know, production jobs and manufacturing are gonna go away potentially through automation. Uh, the tasks that are currently done by humans can be uh, you know, replaced with, with machines, and then the few remaining tasks that are there are either going to be high compensated jobs with four-year degrees or something, or very menial tasks that can be completed through platform labor. Um, you don't appear to be doing that. You're hiring people who you're tr looking to, to train and have them do that work for a foreseeable future. Um, why is that? Why isn't automation and sort of the gig economy an alternative that you are finding to be realistic or desirable right now and in the future? Does it make sense for us to invest in training a workforce if it's going to meet um, sort of that uncertain fate? And before you answer that, let me get Doug in here as well and then we'll answer both. Thank you, and I really appreciate your comments about ETP, and I want to follow up on that. At the last commission meeting, I, I shared a story of all the work we did to steer funding towards a, a large manufacturer, a, a bus company, uh, where we have 500 members, just to get them to stay in California, and how we couldn't compete with any other state in the country. 
Um, I'd like to hear more about the challenges around ETP. Uh, from our perspective, the good things about ETP or California competes for that matter is it sets a wage floor for the workers. And for ETP, as you know, there's a requirement that you actually retain people before you get money and that employers actually have to match the money that the state puts in. And I see Tim Rainey, the executive director of the California Workforce Development Board back there, who's investing in a training partnership, high road training partnership we're a part of that requires employers and labor to be at the table together to commit to creating good jobs. So this is my very long-winded way of asking from your perspective, what are the challenges to getting this funding and what could we do to replicate and build on the successes that we're having? Okay, great, we'll answer those and then we have one more question and I'm actually gonna get this wrapped on time. So go ahead. I'll take the automation. You can take ETP. <laughs> um, so obviously I love automation. I sell automation products. So <laughs> um, I want people to automate. I think this is where people don't really understand how jobs are shifting. And I think this is more a story about scaring people than the, real, than the reality of it. So you've been to our facility. We have UR5s. We have robots. Hasn't hasn't, not one person has lost their job. Now, have we spent money training them to do other things? Yes. Um, I think automation is great. I think automation is really good for the human body because there are certain things like out on my floor where really a person shouldn't be doing that repetitive task all day long. We should want a robot to be doing that. But where I want that person is where they can work uh, collaboratively with coming up with other solutions, uh, the way they learn how to program the machines and work on efficiencies and different types of things on the floor. I think that's a much better use of my talent out on the floor. Um, having somebody do the same task all day long, I don't think is the best use of a human. So um, for, for us, we, we look at it really differently. I, I would say, I. You know, I heard a lot of the same things when actually computers came in, that we weren't gonna have any jobs because computers were on, and that hasn't happened. Just like we weren't supposed to use paper anymore. Well, that hasn't happened. I think there's a narrative out there that automation's gonna take all the jobs away. It's not gonna take it away, but just like with computers, the type of work we're gonna do is gonna change. So this is where, once again, we have to really think about the solutions and our educational platforms and what do we need to be doing to change how work is going to be done? You know, like I said, working collaboratively, having critical thinking skills, those are gonna be really important things. Um, having the ability, it's about brains, not brawn. Having the ability of picking something up here and going like this all day is not gonna be how we define work. But I think that's actually a really good thing. And I just real, thir 10 seconds on this, in terms of the, um, you know, the, the, uh, specifically with the type of work that's being done in, in automation, right? I think that's why the talking about this as skills is so critical because in small businesses that are nimble and that are going into, they're doing manufacturing or other work, they are creating skills in, uh, in their employees that are marketable, not just in that space, but in other spaces. So continuing to think about it from a, a skills frame of what are small businesses doing to create additional skills and different opportunities, I think um, can be informative as we think about workforce. And just on the, on the ETP um, question, great question. I think um, it's definitely a program that has that works really well for a number of employers. I think some of the challenges that we see as a small business organization are that the really small employee, the less scale you have, the more challenging it is. So the, there's administrative cost um, and overhead, again, those three barriers, right? Cost, administrative challenge and, and uh, liability. The administrative challenge is pretty significant to try to figure out how to track it and get all, um, right? There, ETP, I think, is just going digital January 1, 2020. So it's still tracking with paper, 
you know, hours. And so it's a great program, has tons of potential, but I think really assessing how are we making this administratively feasible for really small employers? And if I'm an employer, maybe I want two or three of my employees to go. Well, that's not big enough for me to go get my own ETP yeah. contract. I have to go partner with somebody else. And then how do I fit in? And what we hear from employers and ETP trainers is that um, that administrative burden is actually preventing folks from even getting free money, right? They're saying, I'm doing this training anyway, but the administrative cost of me to figure out how to comply here, it's just not worth my time. I'm just going to upskill my employees on my own. So it's really thinking about how are we really digging in on that administrative piece to make it a uh, right size for really small employers. Okay, great. Fei-Fei, you have the last question. Hi. I have uh, two quick questions. Uh, well, the first one is for both of you, which is... Um, We've heard some of the challenges, including cost and uh, and training. Um, I would love to just hear for each of you to list the top three biggest challenges for recruiting and retaining employees for small businesses. You can define it as smaller than 50, but Pamela, your, your company counts too. <laughs> um, that's the first question. Second question is um, uh, more for Pam and... Uh, I just heard your answer to uh, John's question about automation. And as a robotics professor myself, I also uh, share a lot of uh, belief of what you said. But my question is actually the unintended consequences of automation in manufacturing. What are the potential unintended, especially adversarial consequences that, uh, that we should at this point start for uh, foreseeing and projecting, um, in, in, especially with technology and automation in manufacturing. Okay. All right, so top three, recruiting, retaining. Um, so I heard about the caring company from the panel before. Um, I go to the sediments that Mark talked about. I think when you're a small employer, my number one asset is my employees, so I care a lot. Um, we offered full health care uh, before we were unionized. We're actually the longest continuer um, offering of Kaiser in the East Bay is our company. My dad firmly believed in it. And so, um, so one way I compete is I actually offer a lot of benefits. I, I'm very rich in what I pay. I do profit sharing, 401k. I do full um, health care benefits. Uh, we do, uh, obviously, a lot around training. We also um, do, in terms of people want to go to school, so we offset the tuition fees, and I could go on and on. So that's one way I could pay. And, and it's hard for me, for my size, because um, especially for me, when trying to get engineers, trying to get compete against Apple and Google and, you know, the, the big brands, it's tough. Um, Headhunting is fierce from those companies and Tesla. It's very, very hard for me. One reason why I am here is that type of talent with the engineering programs coming out of Stanford, Berkeley, Davis, you know, they're great. It's really hard to get a kid uh, or a young person to want to stay in a company my size kind of goes back to your question because I'm fairly flat. Like their career ladder doesn't have as long a runway as what they see if they go to like an Apple, right? So that's the type of stuff I work on for recruiting. Um, we pay a lot of recruiting fees. It's really, really expensive. That's the other way we do it. Um, you know, and it, that's, so that's for me. Um, unintended consequences. Uh, well, I think it's actually for all of us. I mean, I think we really are coming into, uh, you know, the K to gray. And we have to think about, it's not just about educating kids through high school or maybe college, is that I think we have to look at careers and career skill sets as being lifelong learning. And so I think as we continue to automate, jobs are gonna keep changing. And I think there needs to be um, an understanding that the job you get hired for is going to consistently change. And as automation keeps changing how we do work, 
We have to keep changing and everyone has to understand that work, the future of work is not like a fixed endpoint. The future of work is going to keep moving. And so we all have to figure out those platforms that allow us to keep moving, to keep everybody skilled in a way that allows them to stay employed. Great, thank you. Mark, you have any reactions on, or closing thoughts? Um, you know, I'll, I'll just, I mean, I think in terms of uh, thinking about attracting and retaining talent, right, as, as, as Pamela mentioned, uh, right, getting the essential skill piece right. I mean, that's sort of, there's specific tech skill, technical skills for certain industries, but really just the idea that um, how, how are, you know, how folks are showing up to work to uh, be engaged and be successful um, and, and, and the challenge there. I mean, we just, our, our friends at Irvine supported us to um, do a whole bunch of focus groups around the state to really look, talk to small business owners and walk through, like, what are your big challenges? And even before we got to the workforce question, they all brought it up. I, it's hard to find folks who want to who want to work, who want to show up and be there. And I think there's a huge disconnect between a lot of sort of business owners and their understanding and expectations of employees and then the expectations of of people coming into work. And there's a big disconnect there. I think it's generational, but I think there are a number of other things at play. And I think bridging that divide, I don't think it's on one side or the other. I don't think it's just the 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 fault of folks coming in saying uh, that um, are looking for jobs that are being accused of not being ready to work. Um, I don't think I, I think that that's a, a I think that, I don't think that's the right frame because I think there's serious challenges there. So I think think really digging into that that aspect, and then the other piece is how do you how do you keep folks right? I mean, um, a lot of the small business owners that we work with are constantly trying to compete against the really big companies that have scale, right? They can put money in different places, so benefits and and flexible work schedules and things like that. Okay, um, I'm not going to try and synthesize because uh, it's impossible for that range of a conversation shortly. And secondly, we're late for lunch and I'm hungry. So um, <laughs> I'm just going to uh, ask you all to give another round of applause for Mark and Pam for spending time with us. Thank you. Um, going to have lunch upstairs and ask you to come back so we're ready to start by 1.10, please. And just for the commissioners to know, when you come back, your name card is going to be moved because we are going to do small group discussions and we'll start that right when we get back. So please look for your name card. Some of your chairs will be on the inside, just to note that. So please sit wherever your name card goes. Thank you so much. <laughs>